We are very pleased this morning to have Congressman Eric Paulson joining us. First elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2008, Congressman Eric Paulson is serving his third term representing Minnesota's third congressional district. Represent Paul Paulson is a member of the Ways and Means Committee, a member of the Joint Economic Committee, and a member of the Free Trade Working Group and the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Working Group. Representative Paulson also serves as co-chair of the House Medical Technology Caucus and is a leader in advocating for the medical technology industry, so important to our state. He brings real-world experience to Capitol Hill with over 16 years of business experience, including working as a business analyst at Target Corporation. Before being elected to Congress in 2008, Representative Paulson uh, represented Minnesota for 14 years in the state legislature, where he also served as House Majority Leader from 2003 to 2007. He received his BA in Mathematics from St. Olaf College here in Northfield, and currently resides in Eden Prairie with his wife and their four daughters. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Congressman Eric Pulse. Well, first of all, thanks for the introduction, Mike, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you. Uh, you know, coming to Twin West is kind of one of the highlights, I think, of the year for me for the for your legislative series as you kick that off with some of the traditional sponsors that you have I see here today. And uh, I also want to commend the leadership now of Brad Meyer, who's taken over at the chamber and is doing an outstanding job of keeping you at the forefront of one of the top chambers in the state, if you think about it. I mean, the Minnesota Chamber is obviously very active, but Twin West is really a key a uh, key component of, uh, I guess, the voice of small business and business in general here in Minnesota. And I think you do that by really involving local elected officials, those who stood up today, and I won't run through all the names because there's so many of you here, but you keep the school boards engaged, you keep the superintendents engaged, you keep uh, your, your board, your, your, twin, uh, your Twin West board is actively engaged, and of course your legislators uh, uh, show up. I mean, they show up and, uh, and you connect with them at the Capitol too, and so I think your voice absolutely makes a difference. And I just want to thank you for being a good resource to me on a number of issues I'm going to touch on this morning. Uh, as, well for, as well as being engaged. One thing I do want to highlight and thank you for in particular uh, and commend you for is the Career Path Scholarship program that you do as, as a chamber. And that's when you recognize adults that also uh, are wanting to make a career change or add new skills or new training, um, you know, you're helping those folks move on as well. Because a lot of people, it's not just getting a new degree, but it's actually getting new training to find a new position or new career. And a lot of people transition from career to career in different ways now than they did ever before when I was first entering the job market, for instance. So you're making a difference in making sure vocational skills are a key, key way of keeping our economy moving too. So thanks for doing that. I thought what I'd do, because there's a lot of big issues, right, and I want to leave time for questions, of course, going on in Washington uh, today, but I'm going to focus my comments particularly around sort of some economic issues because it's the committee I serve on, as uh, Mike had mentioned, with the Ways and Means Committee, uh, and now I'm on the Joint Economic Committee, so I'm going to start there, and then some folks may have questions about Syria and some of those issues uh, coming up. I'll start off with the Joint Economic Committee. Um, I have to tell you, I just got appointed to that committee. It was originally set up is a counterweight to the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And it's a little bit of a different committee. It's a bicameral committee, one of the few that we have bicameral uh, that uh, exists between the House and the Senate. Senator Klobuchar is actually on that committee as well. And what I really appreciate about that committee is it's a little different. You don't just speak to the C-SPAN cameras, all right? It, the charge of the committee is essentially to analyze data, collect data, and then come up with recommendations for Congress to act to improve the economy. So, you know, we look at the job numbers that come out every month and we study them in greater detail. Uh, and so it's a little bit different. I actually, it's a little more thoughtful and I actually appreciate that. And I'll highlight first one of the hearings we had recently. And we had a recent hearings on ways to build job opportunities for veterans and how to help returning vets transition into civilian life and then find employment. Because that's been a challenge for some of our returning veterans. Uh, and there are federal and state programs that we looked at, of course. There are education and college skills programs that we looked at. And we really kind of dive in a little bit about what works and what doesn't work. But one of the highlights that came out of that hearing was a Minnesota company. Now, Minnesota kind of leads the way in many things, right? And one area is, you know, whether it's the Yellow Ribbon Program or other ways of, you know, thanking our veterans and their families. Minnesota had a Minnesota, we had a Minnesota company testify. It was Excel Energy. 
And Excel Energy came in and testified very clearly how they were making a difference hiring veterans by making that a priority to hiring veterans. And using their jobs that they gained in the military to match up with those skills uh, for different positions within Excel Energy. And one of the things they did was they developed a translator on their website. So veterans could go directly on the website and look for that translator and actually translate the skills they had into some of the job positions. Good thing to look at. Other companies can do that. Other chambers should be looking at those, I think, communicating that message. They also developed specific training, continuing education, uh, leadership development just to encourage veterans to stay in these positions for longer than two years rather than just moving on to a different position somewhere else. And then of course they linked up with a wide range of different organizations that helped make this all possible. So it's just another Minnesota success story I thought I would highlight because normally we would not have that opportunity in Congress to share a great story with other colleagues and educate them what's happening in Minnesota. But let me get into some numbers on the Joint Economic Committee. Um, you know, there's no doubt, and I think many of you can appreciate, that our economy still has a long way to go towards solid recovery or where we feel good about economic growth again and reaching our full potential, if you will. Unemployment is still too high. It's better in Minnesota, right, than it is in the national average, but we still do have very much anemic growth. And, you know, historically, if you look at the economy, and this is one of our themes we've been studying in the Joint Economic Committee, the economy normally doubles in the United States every 20 years. We are on path now to double every 30 years. So what does that mean? We've essentially added 10 years onto our growth cycle. That's, you know, that's a long period of time. So we've added a third onto our growth cycle. So we are in a growth gap, if you will. We're in a growth gap. Because normally when you come out of a recession, and this was a deep recession, you usually climb out of it steep. You, know, you should be flying about now at about 30,000 feet with no bumps. Well, we're kind of bumping along at about 10,000 feet with a lot of turbulence, if you will. And, here are the details uh, just from the numbers. I mean, even the Congressional Budget Office recently reported they expect unemployment to remain all the way through the end of 2014 at about 7.5 percent. Um, now, that would be the sixth consecutive year where we've had that high of a level of unemployment, and it's actually the longest period in 70 years, you know, for that long of that, that time frame. So those are sobering numbers if you really think about it. And if you compound the problem a little deeper, it's the long-term unemployment situation. Those that are unemployed for like longer than 27 weeks, for instance, you know, maybe they're called chronically unemployed, that are having more difficulty, that's doubled. That's actually doubled over the last four years. So that, that's the majority. That's about 4.7 million people. And then the labor force participation rate, those, you know, that are in looking for work, uh, is actually dropped significantly. It's at its lowest level in 35 years. Because a lot of people have just given up looking for work. So 3 million Americans have been looking for work for more than a year, you know, a year or longer. And that's about a quarter of all unemployed workers. So, you know, significant sobering numbers. And, you know, if you really looked at where unemployment would be if the labor participation rate were a little bit higher or measured accurately, it'd probably be closer to 14%. And my worry, uh, you know, as an elected official and, you know, as elected officials in, in, in the room here, my worry now is that this is being accepted as the new normal, uh, accepted by the public, accepted by elected officials, and it really should not be that way. Um, and one of the challenges now is that many people who want to work full-time or did work full-time, they can only get part-time work. So that's another factor to think about. I, I worry about that being accepted as the new normal. And the other factor is uh, incomes are down. Incomes are down. In fact, on average, they're about down $3,000 per person. If we, if we just had an average economic recovery, just a C, C grade coming out of an economic recession, uh, every person in this room, every man, woman, and child on average would have about $3,000 more in disposable income. That's about $12,000 for a family of four. I mean, that's a significant amount of money of an adjustment. So, you know, workers are being robbed about $3,000 because of this growth gap. Part-time employment's on the rise. Uh, one of the reasons might be some provisions in the new health care law. I'll talk about that in just a little bit, too. But I look at it like this. Uh, big issues coming up this fall, right, in Washington. You think about it, we've got an opportunity to address this growth, uh, growth gap, but we've got the budget coming up for appropriations. We've got a debt ceiling. We've got the sequester. We've got you know, deficits and national debt to address. And I will just tell you that I continue to believe that one of Congress's biggest shortcomings, in my observation, is it definitely still continues to focus on short-term fixes instead of long-term solutions. And you can apply that to transportation and health care, uh, and certainly in the area of taxes. And I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll talk about taxes for a second, because that's an area that I really want to make some progress on. Um, I think the tax reform is central to getting our economy back onto solid footing again. Uh, and this is not about doing tax reform for tax reform's sake. This is about making the tax code simpler, making it fairer, 
And the one word, <clears throat> excuse me, that has really stood out is making it competitive. Making it competitive so you can compete. I mean, in a global economy, for instance. And, you know, for individuals, it's clear the tax code's too complex, right? It's too complex. Uh, it takes nine, nine out of every ten Americans now either hire somebody to do their taxes or they get the software to complete all the forms. And there, there's no doubt that that's, that's not a tax code that's designed to help hardworking taxpayers. That's a tax code that is designed to help accountants and lawyers and tax planners. I mean, that's, that's just the reality. And even over the last 10 years, there have been about 4,400 changes to the tax code alone. That's about, on average, one change per day. All right? So the tax code's grown to 3.8 million words. Uh, very complex, or as I like to say again, it's ten times the size of the Holy Bible without the good news. Um, <laughs> so it's a monstrosity. And uh, when I got put on Ways and Means Committee and the Republicans were put in charge, we didn't say, okay, well, here it is. We're in charge. We're going to push through our tax bill. We really wanted to approach things differently. And so we've had well over 30 hearings for the last two and a half years, including the first joint hearings that took place in the House and the Senate in 70 years. And it gets into the detail. I mean, these details do matter, debt versus equity financing, financial instruments. Uh, we've done discussion drafts, not with bills, but literally with white papers, 60 pages of legislative text, putting it out there with different options on international tax reform, small business tax reform, and financial services tax reform, and then asking for feedback from different stakeholders. What has that done? It's really allowed a lot of feedback and input to gel some ideas around some concepts, bipartisanly, by the way, to kind of move some initiatives forward. Hopefully, there will be some success, because in the end, if we're going to be successful in this, it's going to have to be bipartisan. It's going to have to be bicameral. Reagan did it with the Democratic Congress. We're going to need a little help from the public pushing this along or from the business community. Um, my two chair, the two chairmen, you know, Republican in the House and a Democrat in the Senate, they've been meeting once a week for the last two and a half years on their own. Um, so, you know, all the pieces are in place that, you know, show this is happening. You know, there's been a little report on this, you know. Actually, the two chairmen have taken a road show where they're going around the country now. Actually, they started in Minnesota. They went to 3M to talk about the international tax side of the equation, and they went to a small business, a bakery, to talk about small business. And I'm actually encouraged by that, because they speak the same language. If they did an interview on a radio, <clears throat> their, their, their language and their verbiage is almost exactly the same. And that's actually what we need more of in Washington in many respects. So on the individual side, it's complexity. Uh, you know, for example, for those of you who deal with higher education, college kids, I have one going to college now, there are 15 different provisions that deal with higher education alone in, in, for an individual taxpayer. That's 90 pages of different you know, uh, reg, uh, you know, inf instructions, I guess, to look at. On the business side, again, it's complexity and competitiveness. I remember one company came in and testified. They had a 19,000-page tax return, 19,000 pages. So think of the army of tax compliance officers that they are employing to go through that process. So the bottom line there, I guess the tax code's antiquated features have really diminished the ability for the United States as a country to be the premier country to locate a business and attract investment and attract capital. And we do have the highest corporate tax rate in the world today. Um, I think we should bring that down to at least average, which would be about 25, 26 percent. You know, we're never going to be the lowest. We're not going to be like Ireland at 12 and a half percent. Uh, but we should just try to get down to be average, and that means getting rid of different expenditures, deductions, et cetera. So that's kind of the conversation we're going through right now. We're hoping that's going to be a part of the conversation as part of the larger budget situation this year, not because we should focus less, uh, any less on cutting spending, et cetera, but we really should talk about growing the economy to bring in more revenue as a part of fixing our budget as well. And the other principle I should mention, too, is small business should not be left off the table. I mean, small business... Uh, is a big driver of economic growth. That's where most jobs have come from in the past. Uh, we want to make sure that income is treated as income and that small businesses shouldn't be paying more than big, business, like, b b any, more than big businesses, I guess. And so in the end, I guess I believe we should have a tax code that promotes hard work and investment and savings and achievement and innovation, and we can be successful uh, in growing the economy in many respects. The medical device tax, which was a part of the health care law, is having an impact. As Mike had mentioned, I, I still serve in leading the, as a co-chair of the Medical Technology Caucus in the House. And we've got the whole Minnesota delegation pretty much on board, you know, to try and repeal it. It's a 2.3 percent tax, not on your profit, but on your revenue. So for those of you that aren't in that field, just imagine 2.3 percent tax on all of your revenue, uh, on your proceeds, going straight out the door. And the difficulty for medical device companies is that a lot of those breakthrough technologies, they take a decade of investment. Venture capitalists invest 
10 to 12 years, uh, maybe on average, and they want to see some profitability after that time. Well, we've just raised the hurdle because you pay tax on revenue, not on profits, for a lot longer to become profitable. So you're going to have fewer of them. And we've seen the larger companies, you know, go through some significant layoffs. Uh, you know, it's been about 10,000 uh, layoffs around the country over the last year and a half, I think, uh, as they've been up, you know, preparing for the tax. On the big companies and small companies, there's just fewer of them. That means the Medtronics of the world and the St. Jude's and the Boston Scientifics, you know, they won't have the small companies to acquire anymore. So I do worry about sort of a lack of, I guess, new innovations entering the marketplace uh, as, as a part of that. The good news, though, you know, the House has strong bipartisan support. You know, I have the bill to repeal the tax. Uh, this year we have more support than last year. Uh, 260 co-authors, a lot more Democrats agree this is just a bad tax to have. And so we can do it at any time. You know, the key, the linchpin is really figuring out how to get it through the Senate leadership. And our senators all voted, you know, as a part of the budget discussion they had in the spring. So we had a symbolic vote, you know, that we'd want to get rid of the tax. 79 votes, senators, Democrat and Republican. I was a little surprised at the high number. But the challenge has been uh, Senator Reid, you know, the leader, doesn't want to change the law in that respect. And so that's been a challenge for the rank and file members to kind of get around that. But I'm hoping it'll be part of a larger package on tax reform later this fall. Since I mentioned the health care law, let me just uh, start by saying this. I think, I mean, obviously many folks have concerns about the law and its Im implications, its rollout, uh, and its effect. And I think we're feeling some of the impacts of, of that law now and the way it was passed in particular. I mean, look, when you've got thousands of pages that get passed, um, nobody reads it before it passes. You've got to wait to find out what's in it, you know, until after it passes. Uh, you know, it's done on a partisan vote. You're not going to get a good product, right? Um, and, you know, even the administration, I think, is recognizing that in a respect because they've delayed the employer mandate on their own for a year. Um, the individual mandate is still in place, although it's self-policing, so that's going to be kind of a challenge, I think, going forward. And there have been other provisions, uh, like the 1099 reporting that have been repealed or signed into law as well by the administration. But I still have concerns about the health care law in other respects, just in terms of some general comments. Premiums are still going up. And they're going up fairly dramatically, actually, primarily for younger folks, as I've met with a lot of business folks. Some of you in this room, actually, have done my tours and visits. Um, some of us said as high as 40 percent for individuals, for instance. That's a pretty a significant hike. And I think Congress is going to be forced to deal with this because it is a pocketbook issue for families, for individuals, for government, and for the business community. Uh, this is not going away. And so this is going to be flat right in front of us. And the latest challenge, of course, is, is the law's definition or changes of what is considered full-time employment. And so instead of 40 hours being full-time, it kind of moves the bar down to 30 hours. And as a result, a lot of folks are moving and companies are moving people as into part-time work and because they're, they're penalized if they've got folks working more than 30 hours. Uh, I just met with uh, several business owners just a week ago, and one of them is a restaurateur. He's got seven different restaurants, 535 employees, and usually restaurants have a lot of part-time workers, right? But 40% of his employees are full-time. But now he's looking at actually moving nearly all of those 40, 41% of folks down to part-time status, below 29 hours. So it's giving the purely wrong incentives. Uh, and he wants to open a new restaurant, so he's kind of got all that on hold. And so that's the challenge with the rollout right now. And uh, for the long term, I've got other concerns in general, because I, I, I really do worry about decreasing the quality of care when you consolidate the delivery of health care. Because you know it, I think it'll eventually it'll result in longer waits for elective procedures. And it'll decrease the, the financial incentives, like we've seen in the, in the medical device industry in particular. It'll decrease the incentives for the industry to develop new products, new drugs, new techniques, new procedures. And that's really what has helped our health care system lower costs in many respects. That's the innovative side. And I think government mandates in general are not going to be a way to, they're not going to be as effective. They're just clearly not going to be as effective as the free market would be. And I do think the solution there more or less lies in driving down costs or allowing any willing insurance provider to sell insurance across state lines, you know, medical liability reform and a whole host of other things. But additionally, I think we should be encouraging physicians, we should be encouraging them to remain in and then form new independent practices, to have that sort of small business entrepreneurial environment. And, you know, right now, the health care is incentivizing physicians to go in the opposite direction and actually, you know, collectively form large group practices. In fact, cardiology, cardiology practices now where they're physician to own, the numbers have actually decreased pretty significantly. In 2007, about 60% of them were physician to own. That's actually dropped down to about only 35% of those practices being physician to own. And so 
I just think in the end it's about getting back to more consumer-driven health care, giving patients more control over their own health care dollars through HSAs or FSAs, flexible spending accounts, so where they're incentivized to shop around a little bit uh, over cost and quality. And I'm the lead author of two different bills in there. But that also means disclosing what the costs are and requiring what the costs are for these procedures because doctors usually don't know what they are. And uh, patients, certainly, or consumers don't know what they are. So that's a key component, too, so you can have a market that actually works. Let me just talk on trade real quick, because I'm excited about trade. I'm excited about the opportunity. And Minnesota, again, has been leading the forefront with exports. Um, and I've taken an active role in a couple of different areas. Number one, um, we've got two different trade opportunities moving forward. Um, one you're going to be hearing about in, in the near future, probably by the end of the year, is this new Trans-Pacific Partnership. 12 different countries that the United States is participating in, Japan's the latest to join, for emerging markets, right? Great opportunity, emerging markets. The other one, though, is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So that's what's Europe. That's with Europe. One of you know, our best friends, our best allies, there's a lot of goods that already moved there. Our economy is so big in the United States, theirs is so big in Europe. If you combine them, 50% of global GDP is with the EU and the United States. 50 percent of global GDP, 30 percent of global trade. Those are big numbers. Now our tariffs are already pretty low with them, so the opportunity here is actually looking at the regulatory schemes and making some differences. And I'm really optimistic that the EU talks are going to address differences in our regulatory processes, and then that's going to allow a lot more economic opportunity because I think trade agreements now are about moving into 21st century issues, like liberalizing cross-border trade and services that are now enabled by the Internet, enlarging investment opportunities, expanding access to government procurement markets so we can access those markets, uh, as well as building bridges between our regulatory approaches, as I mentioned before, and then upholding our shared commitment, because the EU and the United States have very share, uh, strong shared commitment about protecting intellectual property. And that's where we can have an opportunity, uh, particular against... Uh, countries like China that don't hold those same exact standards for rule of law. Um, but on the regulatory side, let me give you an example of how we can see some progress, because there are significant barriers to U.S. exports. It might be with toy companies uh, as an example, but let's just say you had a medical device company, uh, maybe in Minnesota, and the FDA had approved a product, and it's not approved in the EU. We could set up a system where it wouldn't have to go through as costly an approval process also in Europe um, or, you know, that it already went through in the United States. So if we can encourage regulators where possible to determine whether they have equivalent re regulatory outcomes and then if they do and the oversight committees on each side of the Atlantic agree, then you could have an agreement that one product sold in one market would be approved to be sold in the other market. So try to streamline that process. And it's really important for us to work with Europe on those types of global standards because in the end that's going to allow us to lead the way to prevent developing countries from following the bad actors like China and instead follow a specific, more streamlined path for regulations and rule of law and intellectual property protections. So I'm excited about that. There's a lot of companies that are actually going to be participating in this transatlantic opportunity. Think of Polaris that is local here. Um, you know, they're thriving in Minnesota, they're manufacturing, but they are really growing fast in Europe. They are really growing quickly in Europe, and they would benefit greatly from not only reduced tariffs, obviously, but also the regulatory harmonization opportunities and stronger trademark and uh, intellectual protection copyright measures uh, as well. And also another company that would benefit huge is C.H. Uh, Robinson. Uh, which is pretty big now, and they're global, a third-party logistics provider, and they've got thousands of employees right here uh, in, in the area. Uh, but they're doing a lot more now uh, in Europe as well. I want to touch on immigration real quick because uh, there's no doubt, I mean, and I hope we're going to see some action in some respects uh, on immigration. There's so many issues that have sort of, you know, with the Syria issue coming up, for instance, it took all the, the oxygen out of the room on all the other issues. But, I mean, there's no doubt that America's immigration system is broken. Uh, it's hurting our economy. It's locking out the next generation uh, of innovators. And I look at it as an economic issue, so I'm going to look at it through that lens. And I think the goal should be to make legal immigration the best and the only option. That should be the goal. And there's some challenges getting there, I understand that. But if you add more skills and you add more educated workers, that's one of the fastest ways to boost the economy and then, in the end, keep America competitive. Um, I've even got my own bill that focuses more on the STEM side, you know, science, technology, engineering, math because we've got a system right now that essentially brings a lot of foreign-born folks to the United States. They go to school here, we train them here, we educate them here, and then we send them back to their home countries and we don't allow them to be here. So they become our competitors and they start up these companies uh, overseas. So, you know, a lot of Silicon Valley companies, for instance, that were started 
by these folks. Um, we don't have as many of those types of, you know, the brainiacs who started these companies because we're, they're being booted out and they're going back to their home countries and they're starting their ideas there. Um, so that's a change I like to see happen where we can keep those folks here uh, so they become productive, they have, you know, new generations of folks following behind them. And 12% of our immigrants that were part of the 2011 year, uh, only 12% of them were based on merit. Uh, and the other, you know, what, 88% weren't. And so I think we need, to, we need to flip that. We need to flip that and move in a different direction. So we base it more on some other skills and merit. But it's also talking about low-skilled workers because that's, that's, that's a labor need and a labor fill as well. You know, I talked to some of my colleagues in California. Now, they share stories of literally 30% of the crops not being picked, rotting in the field because no one will do it, right? And so there are issues there too. So in the end, if you can have a system where uh, you have a legal immigration system that ebbs and flows with the labor requirements, then you're not going to have people trying to cross the border illegally because you've got to have secure borders, you've got to enforce the border. That absolutely has to be critical. But the key is to have a system that, you know, keeps the turnstile moving so you know who's coming in, but then it ebbs and flows with the labor market. I mean, that's really the key. And when you've got 10,000 retirees a day that are retiring, um, uh, uh, it might be 19,000 uh, retiring a day, actually, uh, the birth rate's not keeping up, you know, to sustain uh, ourselves uh, in the country in terms of the workforce uh, for the needs for other programs down the road. That, that's just demographics um, moving forward. So it really is about we should be bringing in the hardest workers, we should be bringing in the brightest minds uh, to America. So there's opportunity to, to make some progress on many of these issues as a part of uh, economic recovery, filling the growth gap. Um, I, I just really want to thank you again, uh, all the members, you know, you got an active board, you active legislative delegation, uh, you weigh in a variety of issues, transportation, health care, and, uh, and taxes, and it, it makes a difference. You're having an impact is the bottom line, and I appreciate that very much. Um, if I can continue to tour at some of your companies and businesses, please invite me out. I know I've been to several, uh, and that helps me too, because I don't have the answers to all these challenging questions, but I always am in listen and learn mode to make a difference. And I think that's what a lot of folks are expecting in their elected officials. And you got a good representative of those folks here today too. So thanks for having me here this morning. God bless all of you. And I look forward to taking some of your questions. Okay, I've got the mic back here. One of the things people wanted last year was to be able to verbalize your questions instead of us making you write them down. So here we are. Uh, we ask you to keep your opinions short and sweet and ask the question. So let's, let's get to it. Who's got the first one? Here we go. Hi, I'm interested in where you think the SNAP discussion is going to go, and uh, particularly senior nutrition <coughs> issues. Good question. So when the Farm Bill was taken up earlier this year, uh, we had, uh, well, this, the Farm Bill has always been married up with, with nutrition programs, with SNAP, right? And so there was sort of a, a challenge of getting the votes uh, together because the Senate passed a bill with some reductions in SNAP funding. I think it was $4 billion or $5 billion. I can't remember the number. And then the House had a bill that reduced it. It was probably like $10 billion or something. I can't remember the number. But it, 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 it was a little bit of a deeper cut with the goal of getting into a conference committee with the Farm Bill because the Farm Bill had been languishing for a long period of time as well. Well, in the end, there weren't votes to pass the farm. I, you know, I, I supported it. I voted for it uh, to move it forward. But then they ended up going back and separating the two. So now the farm bill passed on its own. And it's been sort of this alliance in the past, I guess, with uh, you know, nutrition advocates and farm programs to sort of marry the two together. And that's you know, the, how they got support to kind of move it forward. I don't have a problem separating them out. I, I think that's fine. Uh, the House is likely to vote even next week on a new SNAP bill. I mean, I've got my own provision in the farm bill or the SNAP program to actually do a little reform just to allow some nonprofits in Minnesota, uh, Congresswoman McCollum and I did this together, to allow nonprofits that uh, want to help homebound seniors that can't get out to Cub, for instance, use their SNAP benefits or those EBT cards so they can have the nonprofit service the groceries, get them, bring them to their homes. I mean, it seems like common sense. The Department of Ag has signed off on a good bipartisan effort there. Uh, but that's something else that's being held up as a part of that. So. I'm hoping it's going to move forward. I do think on the policy level, there are important reforms that can be done uh, because some states have done things that have increased the access to you know, food stamps or those nutrition programs in a way that's really grown them significantly. Uh, and I guess I'm speaking, speaking to uh, you know, these uh, low-income housing energy programs where if a state gives a dollar 
They're out of, then the individual who gets the dollar of LIHEAP funds, so those energy funds, automatically gets signed up for food stamps or the nutrition program. And so that, you know, one dollar is not much skin in the game, right? And so there are policy changes that can be made just to make it a little bit different and, you know, raising it to 20 now, whatever the number might be. There, that's something that should be looked at. It will be looked at. And there's going to be a conference committee. This will get married up. This will be discussed. It could happen as early as next week, uh, potentially. Um, You'd uh, touched on the employer mandate for uh, 2014 being waived to 2015. Is there been any change in the law itself that would push that date back to 2015 so that next year, if there's a hole in the bucket, they can't, there's employers that drop the plan can't get assessed the penalty? You know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of wide open questions here on, on, on the health care law in terms of what's real and what's not. And this, is, this has been the biggest frustration that I hear from business owners because they just want some certainty that, you know, you, you got a plan and, and I suppose you got a plan for the worst, right? Because you budget for the year ahead. And so new taxes are in effect. Those are, those are kicking in now and there are more kicking in in the near future on the individual and on the small business side, as well as a, I guess a lack of understanding if that employer mandate is going to be there because that was considered one of the linchpins of the whole law. It was argued as the linchpin. You have to have that or it's not going to work. And then the, the Treasury Department releases on a blog, well, we're just going to delay it for a year. I mean, first of all, you, you, have to under, you have to have a lack, I guess I have a lack of understanding how you can even ignore the law, you know, and do that in the first place. But what we try to do in the House is say, okay, that's fine. Um, if you're going to delay the employer mandate, let's just reaffirm that in the law. We'll pass that. Uh, but let's also just, re, let's reaffirm and also delay the individual mandate for a year. You know, and, you know, and not have this self-policing effort. Because if you have a self-policing effort of folks that will go on these exchanges in a, in a month uh, and then down the road, and they get subsidies, but they don't have to have anyone looking over their shoulder until maybe later, um, you're going to have a lot of fraud. You're going to have a lot of abuse. And we've got that in other areas of the tax code. We see that in Social Security disability now uh, growing, and we see that in uh, 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 child tax credits as well. And so there's huge abuse there, without a doubt. And you don't have a check there. We tried to pass it. We passed it in the House actually bipartisan support, but the Senate didn't take it up. So that could come back up in the mix this year, but it's a big worry. Uh, so I can't tell you what will happen. Uh, maybe there'll be a little bit more clarity after the next month. There's a lot of debates about the health care law that'll take place over the next month and a half. Um, so maybe there'll be a little bit more clarity around. Uh, the idea is to get some clarity for those of you that are asking those questions. Thoughts on Syria and maybe overall what you think uh, for Congress and yeah. their feelings? Yeah, thanks. Um, oh. Well, I, I'll tell you this, is that uh, number one, okay, it's a very complex issue without a doubt and, you know, in a complex region of the world. And I did not support the President's request for military authorization. I came out earlier against that. But when the, it was interesting to me when we had our briefings this week because you know everyone returned to Washington and we had the classified briefings. But I was a little surprised when we, after the briefings, there were actually more members of Congress that were opposed to what was taking place or being proposed or requested uh, on both sides of the aisle. And I think the, the briefings weren't handled very well. They didn't answer questions. And, and the clear message was that this was more about just trying to send a message to Assad, who you know I believe I believe he's used chemical weapons. So I'm not going to dispute any evidence there. But I do also believe that rather than being engaged in a Syrian civil war, it's been going on for two years, uh, it might have been easier to do something a little earlier, a year ago. Uh, it's a lot tougher now, two years down the road. This is someone who's already killed well over 100,000 people without chemical weapons on his own. And so that's going to continue. And this was not about you know, going after the bad actor, whoever ordered the attack, uh, or securing the weapons or destroying the weapons. It was about sending a message to level the playing field, you know, so the rebels would have more of a fighting chance for a while. So it just prolongs the war. So no clear U.S. military objectives from my perspective uh, or interest, and it's, it's very open-ended. And so now that's changing hour by hour. And so, you know, I'm not happy with Putin being on the world stage. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of a joke because he's Assad's number one ally. And uh, he has no record of human rights himself. So we're in a very difficult spot as you know, a country trying to lead in that area right now. And you hope there's going to be a diplomatic solution. I do really believe that, that, that the opportunity is there to lead the international community to try anybody that is responsible 
for using chemical weapons, because 191 countries, I believe, have signed this ban. You know, Syria said they didn't have them. Well, now they signed the ban, right, to trying to get out, uh, which is kind of interesting. But anyone who used them, they should be held accountable in an international tribunal. And that's been used successfully in the past with other dictators that have been abusive, you know. Uh, and we've got those guys. And we should be doing that. We should try that. That's what we should be doing. I appreciated your comments on long-term transportation funding, and obviously that's been a, a long-term problem for us here. But with your new committee that you're on for economic uh, development, have you had anybody come in to talk about the investments in transportation and infrastructure and how that does impact economic development uh, in this country? Yeah. Um, well, I've had a lot of folks come in, uh, engineers, architects, transportation advocates, uh, on a regular basis. And one thing that I have supported is, uh, in fact, Tim Walls and I, you know, from southern Minnesota, advocated for last year, and we did again this year, is to say, okay, we should open up more of our off-shelf, uh, uh, outer continental shelf for energy exploration. Right now, 85% of that is off-limits. It's, it's tightened up a lot under the new administration. They just have closed that off. And now most of our energy development is all internal, you know, with the fracking technologies, et cetera, that are going on in a resurgence, which is bringing manufacturing back to the United States, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, with lower energy costs. But I think we should open up a lot more of those continental shelves. So we introduced legislation that would take the royalties, take the proceeds from that, and specifically designate it for infrastructure. Because we do have a cliff with the Highway Trust Fund. I mean, it's been used, le uh, you know, there are less people driving, better miles, uh, ex you know, mileage per gallon, et cetera. So the trust fund's not up. And plus, we've been backfilling the trust fund now with general funds. Well, we're coming up against a cliff again. Will there be a big drop off uh, where we're not filling it back in? So we've got to find some source to keep infrastructure there, because infrastructure is key for economic growth as well. Whether it's a third lane on 494, you know, I think that some folks would advocate for uh, in here to finish the completion around the loop here, uh, or other, you know, 212, 610, the final two miles of Highway 610, which has been on the books forever and ever. So that would actually, if you even took that money, I mean, the dollar signs do show from the accounting. It would be the largest investment in infrastructure in the history of the country. And you, know, and you can also take some of that money, use it on canalways and locks and things like that that have also been degraded over a long period of time. I think that is the best opportunity for some bipartisan support, actually. Hi. With regards to tax reform, you mentioned wanting to reduce the corporate rate. Yeah. But the fact is the majority of small businesses are flow-through entities. So they pay the tax on the individual, which is almost 40%. So what's being done to try to get that reduced? Right, yeah, and that's why I mentioned earlier that small business cannot be left off the table because uh, you have a lot of pass-through entities, you know, partnerships, uh, uh, et cetera, and sole, you know, uh, S corporations, for instance, and that's got to be included. And so income treated as income, you know, small business should, shouldn't be treated any differently because they choose that pathway under an S-corp or a pass-through. So the goal, get down to around 25% for both. I mean, that, that's the goal. That's what the budget has that we passed in the House. Now we're trying to sort of, you know, tinker with numbers. You know, the one good thing that I did here, and I remember and reflecting on for all the testimony, whether it was small or medium or large companies that talk about the need for tax reform, because, you know, certain companies certain benefit from certain provisions, right? Loopholes, whatever you want to call them. But there was a clear message saying, hey, we would be willing to get up, give up some of these different expenditures. You know, one company said even the research and development tax credit, you know, which is pretty big for driving innovation uh, in competing with other countries. But they said the best thing you can do for them, let them know where their rates are going to be in five, ten years. Don't have it be second-guessed because Congress is always passing, you know, six-month extension, a one-year extension, a retroactive provision. It does nothing to build confidence for how you invest in your capital or your, or your people or your equipment, right? Uh, and so if you just have the rules of the game laid out in a lower rate on average, that's where the opportunity is. So that's the direction we are absolutely trying to move in. And that means making sure small business is in the exact same camp. And politically, that's smart too, right? Because you don't want to be helping big corporations. It's just easier to sell in general. So I think the package together makes sense, and that's, that's an opportunity.
Yeah. Okay, so two things. First, on the monetary policy, that's something we've looked a little bit on the Joint Economic Committee because Bernanke's come to testify, and we're in the 100-year anniversary, actually, of the anniversary of the Fed being created. So I think it's really a time to relook at the Fed, what its mission is, what its role is, you know, in terms of inflation and unemployment. And we should really be trying to get back to a rules-based sort of set of rules, right, for the Fed to follow because they're just kind of winging it right now and uh, kind of going through with a lot of, you know, open questions like what you just mentioned. So that's sort of, I think, the impetus to try to do some things. And there's some legislation to actually move that forward, um, some of those ideas forward. There's going to be a new Fed chairman appointed later uh, in the late this year going into next year. So this debate will be front and center, which is actually a good thing because uh, it's very difficult when the QE3 and QE1, Q, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3 have been so high Right, and, and how, do you, how do you wind down? How do you come out of that, right? Uh, eventually interest rates go back up, and that's gonna really consume a large chunk of our debt, by the way. When you get a $17 trillion national debt and debt payments going out the door, that's really gonna chew up a larger part of the budget when, when, and when that happens. It will happen at some point. Uh, it, it's gotta be a little bit controlled, right? So on the regulatory side, you know, I, I, I really do worry and still worry that Dodd-Frank is still gonna be uh, you know, so problematic for community banks and small banks that it's, gonna, it's just going to squeeze them out of the market uh, as there's been more consolidation in the larger institutions. And large institutions are fine, but a lot of these community banks are similar to the chamber experience where you know who you're sitting with, they're involved in their community, they help the local softball team, and you walk down the street and you can get a loan, et cetera, right? And that we, we, that's sort of disappearing because you've sort of got this large monolith now that has imposed a lot of rules for large banks that has trickled down to smaller banks and the Dodd-Frank regulatory scheme is definitely impacting smaller institutions where they have to hire compliance officers uh, like they've never had to do before. And you know, I remember one, uh, in fact, uh, Beacon Bank uh, has mentioned specifically, they said they go through an audit. Well, what does an audit mean? Well, it means not one person sitting in the office for a week. It means like 14 people coming in the office and sitting in there for a month and a half you know, grinding through everything. And that just slows everybody down from actually evaluating business loan opportunities and keeping their bank afloat, right? And so that weight makes a difference. So we've tried to push some reforms through, actually, in the House to reform Dodd-Frank and have run up against a roadblock in the Senate, unfortunately. But your advocacy can continue to help there as well. Great answer. All right. Yeah. Are elected officials allowed to ask a question? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> as long as I have the chance. You know, as current chair of higher ed, uh, I've been listening to students, and we are so concerned about the amount of debt that they have. And so we can only do so much in the state. I think, you know, the real opportunity is to do something from a federal perspective, and I wonder if you have thoughts or ideas about that. Yeah, a really good question. And by the way, I want to commend state legislators. You know, when I was there, too, we've always had a great bipartisan effort to uh, support the Minnesota Grant Program, which has helped students regardless of public, private institutions and the path you choose. It just focuses on the student. Minnesota is, again, a leader and a model in that area, and that's that, you know, in, thanks for just leading on some of those issues here at the state level. One good news, a piece of good news that happened is that, you know, the student loan rate issue that was set by elected officials or politicians in Washington, we kind of finally clipped that where it's not going to be coming up year after year wondering, having parents wonder where's the rate going to be when we have to apply for a loan, right? And we set up this political cliff. We got away from that. We actually established it, set it to market rates. Uh, the House went on it early and the Senate went along. The President signed a law last month, I think. So you won't be hearing about that next year. That's the good news. Um, so in the end, it, you know, whether you're public, private institutions, and you know, I know Rasmussen's here, right, as a sponsor. I mean, these are institutions that are doing good things under different training opportunities and education opportunities to uh, you know, help the workforce, right? College education costs. Now, the president's got a new proposal that looks at actually having a value connection to uh, financial aid. I think that's worth looking at. Um, my only concern with making sure there's no tentacles or sort of so much overreach at the federal government level becomes like a Dodd-Frank or a regulatory scheme where it makes it hard for institutions to, you know, interact with their clients, if you are their consumers or, or, or students. But the debt issue is a real issue. And in fact, unemployment is a lot higher among folks that are just graduating from college. It's probably closer. I've heard his numbers as high as 50%. And then they got that debt load on, right? So you got a lot of default coming down the road for students who don't find work, who have that, that debt load over them. So there are no easy answers. Now, some, some opportunities might be to look at 
college institutions uh, and their endowments? Are their endowments at a certain you know, level? Uh, do they have favorable tax treatments that they shouldn't have at a certain level? Uh, because some institutions probably treat those endowments at such, you know, they're well over a billion dollars, for instance. And you wonder if they're actually plowing that money back into the students. But they do raise tuition, you know, historically well above inflationary levels. Um, but I do think there is, there, there is value for us to be looking at some of the proposals that attach student, student aid or financial aid to value of success in the marketplace. And, you know, the president proposed that, so that's something worth looking at. Maybe some more states actually may look at that uh, as well individually. Um, so no easy answers, or actually it would have been solved before, but um, when students are in an iPod world, right, more students are doing online learning, things like that, that's going to put more pressure on bricks and mortar institutions to do things differently as well uh, for different models of training in the future. Good. One last question. There's talk, um, just, just a little bit of talk right now about HUD looking at zoning laws and which might take away local control. Do you know anything about it? It's just pretty new that's just starting to bubble up. But it could change a lot of communities across the United States. Okay. Do you know anything about it? I mean, you may not. It's just pretty yeah. new, just starting to bubble up in the media. You know, I'll be honest, Carter. I, I, have, not, I have not heard of that. Um, I guess I wouldn't be surprised because from, you know, a bureaucracy or an agency standpoint, it's sort of been a trickle down. And, you know, it's happened with the EPA. It's happened with, you know, SEC and Dodd-Frank. It's happened all over in, in Health and Human Services. So I'll follow up with you on that because I'd like to know about it. Um, Oh, I can believe it. Um, so I'll follow up on that. And all right, good, good. Hey, uh, and, and and thanks again for having me here. One way, I also want to commend Deb McMillan. Uh, you know, you took her from the Southwest Chamber. She's a great, strong advocate to have here as well. I'll stick around for a little bit. Uh, thanks for having me here, and just continue to stay in touch. I appreciate it. One of the things I always appreciate about Eric Paulson and his office, well, there's several of them. One is availability, just coming to events like this, as well as his town forums and the other avenues, his uh, business visits, etc. I've always found his office very available. If you have input, they'll listen and they'll get it to him. Secondly is the fact he listens. He listens to this group, he listens to many others, and he doesn't just listen cordially, he listens. And he, he assimilates the information, digests it, and carefully weighs that in his decision making. And third, he possesses something I think a lot of Washington uh, legislatures do not, and that's common sense. And so I appreciate that of him for his listening, his availability, and his common sense. So thank you. Okay, so I want to give thanks to our series sponsor again, Grand Casino. Because uh, in Hinkley and Mille Lacs, it's so important, and all our sustaining sponsors uh, posted behind me, as well as AVEX and Comcast. So I'd like to highlight just a few upcoming events, and then we're done for the day. One, we are pleased to have Norwood Teague, athletic director from the U of Minnesota, speaking at our leadership luncheon on September 18th, which is next Wednesday. You can find the details and register to attend at our Twin West website at twinwest.com. Secondly, please mark your calendars for our upcoming annual celebration on October 2nd, October 2nd, at the Golden Valley Golf and Country Club, where we will elect our new board members and give much-deserved recognition to our chamber volunteers. I hope you will all attend that. And finally, please join us again next month on Friday, October 11th, for our next legislative breakfast. With that, we bring this to a close. Thanks for coming today. Have a great Friday and a wonderful week.